Good morning. And we are in the book of John, so if you have a Bible, feel free to grab it. There is some in the chairs in front of you. There's some at the Welcome Center. If you don't have one, take one of those with you, because that's our gift to you. If you don't own a Bible, we would love to give you a Bible. One of the things we love to do as a church is to give away Bibles. It's a great thing to do. So there are some on the Welcome Center. Otherwise, iPhones, iPads, Android, whatever you got. Uh, Bible.com, version is the Bible app. Um, a great, great way to get into the Bible in a regular way. But it's my joy to continue preaching here through uh, the series that we're working on in John. And if you're following along, open up to John 2. We're going to be in John 2, 13 through 22 today. And we last week we looked at the the very first miracle that Jesus performed where he had turned water into wine. And now we're going to be looking at Jesus as he enters into the temple and cleanses the temple. It's an interesting story that that John recounts for us here. And I'm going to read to you uh, John 2, 13 through 22 if you would like to follow along. And there it says, the Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them out all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and he overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said to him, It has taken forty-six years to build this temple, and you will raise it up again in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed in the scriptures and the word that Jesus had spoken. Now, if you haven't been here, what you need to understand in the Gospel of John, John John is a unique guy writing a unique story, completely different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It is still one of the Gospels, but it's not part of the Synoptic Gospels. And what John is trying to do in his Gospel account is he's, he's, he's trying to get you to see who Jesus is. He wants you to understand at a fundamental level, this is who Jesus is. Because it's not enough for us to know what Jesus does if we aren't intimately familiar with who Jesus is. I mean, it's not enough just to know about the stories. We need to know about the man, right? So here's the main point for today. In this text, we're going to see that that Jesus is a prophet who challenges the spiritual consumer. We're also going to see that Jesus is a priest who cleanses us from sin. And we're going to see that he is a king who builds a temple for God's presence. And we'll start off with that very first one. Jesus. Jesus is a prophet who challenges the religious status quo, the the spiritual consumerism of his day. And we see this in verses 13 through 17. They paint this incredible picture. Uh, Verses talking about this Passover being celebrated, right? And, And the Passover, as you may or may not know, Passover is this Jewish celebration that occurred every year, still occurs to this day. Um, it's a, it's a gathering together of the Jews coming together each year to celebrate what God had done for them as He brought them out of slavery, as He brought them out of bondage, as, as He, as He took them from the hand of Pharaoh and liberated them from Egypt. And so, Every single year, because of what God had done on their behalf, the Jewish people were gathered together to celebrate what God had accomplished. And this included, of course, Jesus. And so Jesus has come to this Passover celebration to celebrate with his fellow brothers and sisters what God had done in the Exodus. And he shows up at the temple, right? And he sees something that's absolutely shocking to him. He, he gets to the temple and he sees there, there's people selling animals. And there's people, they're, they're exchanging money. And so he engages in this intense conflict. And the conflict in this passage is between spiritual consumerism and true worship. Between corrupt religiosity and true discipleship. Let me see if I can explain this for you. You see, the men and women coming to this Passover celebration, coming to the temple, they were traveling distances, some of them great distances, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, sometimes 100, maybe even 200 miles to come and participate in this time of worship. 
And do you know it's really hard to carry for 200 miles? A goat. You ever tried to move a goat more than about five feet? Good luck. They got a mind of their own, right? And so they're coming, and, and they have these issues with what they're supposed to do. And so, so they've basically set up a, a business system that allows you, for your convenience, to go and, and buy your gift, to go and buy your offering right there at the temple. Not outside of the temple, not, not somewhere else in Jerusalem, but actually right here in the temple. And so Jesus comes in, and we need to be careful so that we know He's not frustrated because there's some sort of commerce happening. What He's frustrated with is where it's happening. See, He's not frustrated at all that, that, that people are going to be offering sacrifice. That's what they were supposed to do. That's, the, that's what you do at the temple, right? And He's not challenging them about their, their buying and making sacrifices. He's challenging the fact that the commerce is happening inside the temple of God. In verse 15, he, he, he makes a, a whip of cords, right? And he drives them out of the temple with, with the sheep and the oxen, and he pours out the, the money from the tables, and he flips over the tables. And so, if somebody ever tells you, what would Jesus do? Remember, whips and flipping tables is among the answers that he could possibly do, right? But why is, why is Jesus doing this? I mean, why is He doing what He's doing? And the reason He's doing this is because as a prophet, Jesus is challenging the religious status quo, which was marked by spiritual consumerism and convenience. And it's important for us to see that He's not condemning their sacrifice. That was the proper system at this time. Jesus hadn't gone to the cross yet, right? He's not condemning the market. He's condemning consumerism that had begun to overtake their spirituality. Uh, what do you mean, Pastor, by spiritual consumerism and spiritual convenience? What, what does that mean, right? Well, I want to see if I can set this conversation up by saying I think there's two things that we will all recognize that could be part of spiritual consumerism. Not just theirs, but actually ours as well if we're not careful. And the first one of those is this. Spiritual consumers put themselves at the center of worship and not God. And it's often not something that we do intentionally. I mean, you see, these men and women, they're traveling, some of them, hundreds of miles to offer their sacrifice to the God who saved them from Egypt. And so they're coming long distances. And what are they looking for? Convenience, right? Ease. Make, make my relationship with God, make my worship with God as easy as possible. What's the path of least resistance? What's the minimum I can do to get the biggest return on the spiritual experience? What's going to cost me the least but gain me the most? And eventually, and, and, and here's what you have to catch, eventually, slowly, our felt needs begin to take precedence over the worship of God. Our felt needs, whether we realize it or not, begin to shape and form the actual worship of the God that we are worshiping and participating in worship with. And the temple begins to represent a marketplace rather than a place of worship. What happens is it, it becomes transactional rather than relational and worshipful. What can I get, rather than what can I give? Their felt needs are changing the very fundamental act of worship. The very thing that they had come to participate in. And I know it would be easy for us to say that, that this was simply only happening just back in Jesus' day, but it happens in the contemporary church as well, where our felt needs begin to take precedent over the actual worship of God. Do you realize that sometimes we, we act like we are sovereign in the worship gathering, right? But only truly is Jesus sovereign. 
so easy for our spiritual lives not to be marked by the sovereignty of God, but rather by our preferences and by our, our so to speak, consumer opinions. And unintentionally and, and very quietly and subtly, we begin to put our, our own personal felt needs ahead of our worship of God. So the, the temple is no longer about who God is, but it's about what they want. And the consumer is, in this view, not God. And their experience of worship has become more important than the actual act of worshiping God himself. Oftentimes, we're so worried about worshiping false gods, about setting up idols in our lives. But Jesus comes in and tells us in this story that it's possible to worship the true God falsely. It happens right here in John 2. And Jesus says, we have to be very careful not to put our our, our felt needs, our, our desires, our preferences, our consumeristic assumptions above the worship of God. And so that's the first point related to spiritual consumerism. The second point is that we can unfortunately, unintentionally, have an incomplete view of God. What does Jesus say here? First thing he says in this passage is, take these things away. My father's house is not a house of trade, right? Jesus is saying if we want to have a a right view of worship, a right view of our, our spiritual relationship with God, of the sacrifice we make to be in relationship with God, that it needs to be governed by our view of God. And what we see in this text is an emphasis of the love of God to the neglect of the holiness of God. You see, these people assume that that God was all-loving, all-patient, and all-merciful, which He is. We we agree to that. God is all-loving, yes. God is all-merciful, absolutely. God is patient with us, without question. But God is more than just that. God is also holy. God is set apart, distinct, full of wrath and judgment as well. And spiritual consumerism is marked by worship that doesn't take into account the full nature, the full character of God. These men and women who were selling the oxen and the sheep and the pigeons were assuming that as long as they were worshiping God, that they would be honoring God. And what Jesus does is He reminds us that He's also full of of justice and holiness. Spiritual consumerism, my spiritual consumerism and yours, has a tendency to emphasize the love of God to the neglect of the holiness of God. And when we do that, we, we, we sacrifice the holiness of God on the altar of our own spiritual convenience. Jesus' view of worship is dictated not by who we are, but by who God is. Consumers view worship as being dictated by who we are. Disciples view worship by being dictated by who God is. Jesus is saying there there are proper ways to worship and improper ways to worship. And if God is love, He is also holy. And that should shape the way in which we approach Him, the way in which we worship Him. And if we only ever emphasize the love of God as inviting and yearning, uh, the, the, the sinner, the, 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 the seeking lovesick passion for us that we have, you know, just to be simply having that love of God. And if that's all that we do, at the exclusion of His justice, to His exclusion of His glory, to the exclusion of God's holiness, well, then our worship ceases to be Christian. Because if we only have a God of love, if we only have a God of mercy, if we only have a God of patience, you have an incomplete God. You don't have the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is full of love and mercy, absolutely, and justice, but patience and holiness and set-apartness and wrath and judgment towards sinners as well. And if you take away the holiness of God, you take away the cross,
If you take away the holiness of God, you take away the work that Christ did on the cross. We sacrifice holiness of God, oftentimes as spiritual consumers, for our own convenience. And the love of God without the holiness of God ceases to be Christianity. Because, hear this, the greatest danger to your faith in our culture, and in our world in fact, is that we might allow spiritual consumerism and spiritual convenience to dictate our view of who Jesus is. The greatest challenge to our faith in this day, in, in our lives, in a day-in, day-out way, is that we would allow that to distort our view and vision of the glory of Jesus Christ. Because here's what happens when we do that. Consumer Christianity will give you just enough Jesus to inoculate you to Jesus. Right? So when you get the flu shot, they, they give you... It's an inoculation, right? They give you a little bit of something that's like the flu that they think you might get so that you can build an immunity to it. Can you imagine building an immunity to Jesus? But that's often what happens in our culture. It can be people who go to church every week. You show up because it's an obligation, not because it's worship, right? You're expected. I was that kid. You know, I never did drugs, but I was a kid that was drugged to church. <laughs> and it wasn't worshipful. And that's not because of my parents' fault. They did their part. That's a good thing. But a lot of us, sometimes it's just punching the time clock, right? It's just checking that off of my list for the week of things to do. And if we do that, we begin to inoculate ourselves, actually, to Jesus. Consumer Christianity will tell you all kinds of things. It'll, it'll give you the, the candy-coated, sugary version of who Jesus was. But it often doesn't remind us that He's holy and He's just and He's righteous. And what happens then is consumer Christianity makes Jesus out to the mascot of our lives. But I tell you, Jesus will have none of that. And you know what the... The scary part of this text that we just read is, for me at the least, these people had no idea this was going on, right? They did not realize they were participating in spiritual consumerism. They were just there for worship. And that's scary to me, right? They were doing what they thought God had asked them to do. And Jesus comes in, flipping over tables, making a whip of cords, saying, I'll have none of this. You've destroyed the worship of our Father. And I think because of our culture, we find so many people are too interested in a preferential, experiential Christianity, but not the presence of the living God. But here is the good news. Jesus loves you too much to serve as the mascot for your life. Jesus is too, too lovely. Jesus is too beautiful. Jesus is too grand and majestic and holy to be just the simple mascot of our lives. He is your Lord. Jesus is a prophet who is going to challenge the spiritual consumerism, not just of his day, but of ours as well. And as a prophet, he comes and he's here to wake us up from our spiritual slumber. And he says, I refuse to be your spiritual mascot because I am your Lord. And the Lord is something so much greater. But Jesus isn't only just a prophet. Jesus is also a priest who cleanses us from our sin. Look at verse 15. It says, he makes a, a whip of cords and he drives them out of the temple, right? And Jesus is a, a prophet who confronts our sin. But he's also a priest in that he's going to cleanse us from our sin. One of the key responsibilities for the Old Testament leaders, right, for the priests, one of the key responsibilities spelled out for them in the Old Testament is to cleanse the temple, to prepare the temple for worship. But the temple priests here in John 2 had failed 
to do their job. Why? Well, because now the temple basically looks like a bank. It's a place for commerce and economy. And so Jesus, the, the true priest, comes in and he scourges the temple. He cleanses it. He purges it from filthiness and ungodliness. And this passage reminds us that, that, that Jesus isn't just soft and tender, right? He's also firm and, and has anger and righteous indignation against sin. But I want to show you something else that I think we often overlook in this text. Because look at this and look closely. It says that Jesus drove them out. Right? Jesus drove them out. And that is not judgment. That is mercy. It would be judgment if the text said, He looked, He shook His head, and He walked away. Right? He left them there in their sin. That would be judgment. Mercy is, is that He drives them out. Judgment is that He leaves us to wallow in our own sin. See, Jesus wants to wake us up. He wants to cleanse us from our sins. Even sometimes sins that we don't know we're committing, just like these folks, many of them had no idea they were participating in a broken system. And it's the mercy of God to confront us in our sin, but not to leave us there, not to leave us as we were, but to also then cleanse us from our sin. How horrible would the, the good news be if Jesus confronted us in our sin, but then didn't cleanse us from our sin? The good news is that when Jesus confronts you in your sin, what's He going to do next? He's going to cleanse you from your sin. And that's exactly what we see in this passage here. He confronts them, but then He cleanses them. And what's funny about this passage is, is He often cleans the areas that religious people don't think need to be cleansed, right? You mean, all of us, I bet every single one of us have kind of those periphery sins, I might call them. Those, those, those sins on the fringe that are kind of culturally acceptable sins, right? Those sins we'll talk about struggling with publicly. Like, oh yeah, man, I, I ate the whole bag of Cheetos, right? We can talk about that publicly, because that's, that's kind of one of those periphery sins. Oh, I struggle with greed, I, I just want more money, you know? We, we, we can joke about that. I've tried being poor. I'd like to try being rich. Right? We, we can joke about those kinds of things. Because they're culturally acceptable. But what Jesus is, is doing here is something that's so offensive and so invasive that the people don't even realize at the moment that they're committing sins. And so He confronts them and, and challenges them and ultimately cleanses them. And hear this. If Jesus is disciplining you, you can be sure that Jesus loves you. Right? I, I've, I've had to say this to my son in the past. He doesn't want to be disciplined, but I have to say, buddy, it's because I love you, actually. It's not because I'm angry with you. It's not because I want to punish you. It's because I love you that we need to correct this. Any parent understands that, I think, inherently, right? Our goal is not to punish our children. Our goal is never to punish our children. But the same way with God, when we see something that's not going the way it is, we need to intervene. And so if Jesus is disciplining you, you can be sure that He loves you. If God is confronting you, cleansing you of your sin, even if it's painful, you can know that you are indeed loved. It's painful when we have these idols in our heart, chased out by a whip of cords, right? It's painful as Jesus flips over the tables of our lives, exposes our sin, and drives it out of us. But in the long run, it's for our good. And the incredible thing about Jesus is that these people who are participating in the spiritual consumerism, looking for convenience and consumption here, it's people like that who he's graciously actually transforming in this text, saying, get up and leave. Don't participate in this kind of spirituality anymore. 
And so Jesus is a, a prophet who challenges us. He's a priest who cleanses us. And then as I said, third, Jesus is a king who builds a temple for God's presence. Look at verse 18 with me. It says, So the Jews said to Jesus, What sign do you show for us doing these things? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews said to them, It's taken 46 years to build the temple, and he'll raise it up in three days? But, as we know, he was speaking about the temple of his body. The first part of this text shows that the Jews are really offended, right? And why are they offended? Because Jesus is assuming authority that they thought that they had. On what authority do you come rolling in here? Thinking, you can bust up our religious gathering, telling people that they're sitting, flipping over tables and, and bringing a whip of cords. What authority do you have, pal, to be doing this kind of thing? Give us a sign, right? Is what they say. That you, that you are meant to have this kind of authority. Give us a sign that you are at our level religiously. Give us a sign, pal. Show us, right? Put up or shut up. That's what they're saying to Jesus. And ironically, the beginning of this book of John is about the signs, right? But does Jesus give them a sign? No, he doesn't. And here's why. I think Jesus doesn't actually give them the sign that they're asking for, because if he gives a sign to these spiritual consumers, it will only further reduce their view of God. And I don't want you to miss that. If you give a sign to a spiritual consumer, it only further proves to shrink their already domesticated view of God. D.A. Carson, brilliant Christian theologian, says it this way. He says, A sign that would satisfy them, presumably some sort of miraculous display performed on demand, would have signaled the domestication of God. That sort of God does powerful stunts to maintain people's allegiance. Does Jesus need to perform stunts, tricks to perform things of that nature for our allegiance? No. And that's why he doesn't perform a sign here. A God who performs signs on demand is actually no God at all. That's what a pet is for. Roll over, sit up, speak. That's what pets do, not God. Spiritual consumers want a sign from Jesus. Disciples just want Jesus. They demand an immediate sign. But you see, Jesus instead delays it until the resurrection. Because God does not operate on our timetable. Because God is not a pet. He doesn't need training. We do. So oftentimes, we want God to act immediately. But many, many times, God's response is simply, wait. I'm going to give you something so much better. God doesn't work on our timetable because discipleship is a slow process. Frankly, a lot of times, growing in faith is a painful process. But it's a transformative process. And if we will see it through, we will be better at the end than we were at the beginning. Spiritual consumers demand all kinds of signs, but there is no better sign to shut the mouths of spiritual consumerism than an empty grave. The best sign is that Jesus defeats sin and death and Satan, and he raises to walk, and he invites us into a newness of life. And that's far better than any other sign we could possibly get. Because those of us who get Jesus don't only just get Jesus, but we get the greatest sign of all, which is the resurrection from the dead. He says, destroy this temple and I'll raise it. Three days later. And if you've studied the Bible, the only person who is fit to raise a temple is a king, right? Right? But Jesus, of course, is talking about an entirely different form of temple. He's talking about his body. That's what the text says, anyhow. He's not talking about the temple that was the centerpiece of all of Jewish life. The centerpiece of where all of worship took place as a Jew. 
He says, destroy that temple. Destroy it, and I will raise it again. And we see at the cross the body of Christ, where, where literally the love of God and the holiness of God collide. Where God's love for you is met with God's wrath for you. Where Jesus becomes a shield for you so that the wrath of God that was intended for you would be exhausted on Him. And He proves Himself to be so powerful that your sin does not keep Him dead. But instead, He raises Himself from the dead. Do you realize that, that, that Paul says that if Jesus is not raised from the dead, then we are still dead in our sins? And if Jesus dies at the cross for yours and my sin, and if you are still in your sin, you of all people, Paul says, that then we should be pitied. If the cross of Christ wasn't enough to buy our forgiveness, if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, Paul says, everything we do is silly and wasteful. But the good news is, He died and He rose again. And this is a communion Sunday and we are going to be celebrating that. The gospel gives us such a better word. See, Jesus overcame Satan's sin and death through a resurrection of the dead. Jesus says, my body will be the fulfillment of the, what the, all the temple meant. It's the center of true worship. In this new temple, in his body, the ultimate sacrifice for sin will take place. See, they were coming to sacrifice again and again and again every year at the Passover. Jesus comes and says, I've done away with that. And I've become your permanent, perfect eternal sacrifice. He's done that for you and He's done that for me and He's done that for His church and for all who would believe. And then after He resurrects, He sends us His Spirit in Acts 2. And Paul then says in 1 Corinthians 3.16, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells within you? So we've gone from an Old Testament system of a broken system of worshiping and bringing sacrifices to a, to, a, to a temple, to Jesus becoming to the temple, and then through the Holy Spirit, we now have God dwelling within us, if we have Jesus. And the greatest news of all is that because Jesus resurrected from the grave, that you have access to the presence of God. Not just because you come to some temple, but because God is in you. That should be exciting, hopefully, for you. If Jesus is your Lord and Savior, He has rescued you. That is something worth celebrating. That's why we here at Glory Baptist Church are, are passionate about telling people about Jesus, wherever, whenever we can. Because you see, Jesus is not done building His temple yet. Jesus is still extending His glory to all of creation. And He won't stop until it's done, and neither will we. That should be exciting for you, I hope. We believe this mission is true. King Jesus has overcome sin and Satan and death in the grave, and He is sending His temple into all of the neighborhoods and into all of the nations as He establishes His presence among us. And here's what's incredible. How much better is that than the good old spiritual consumerism? Why participate in spiritual consumerism when you can have this? A prophet, a priest, and a king. That is so much better than cultural Christianity and spiritual consumerism. And the mission of the king beats spiritual consumerism every single day of the week. It raises the bar. It creates expectations. But I know we can do it. We're going to celebrate communion in a minute. And I would challenge you between now and then, do some business with God. Get frank with God. Open your hearts with God. Get right with God. And then celebrate the work that is 
finished. Amen? Let's pray.